Welcome everybody to the webinar on process mining for customer journeys. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'm here today um, with Matthias. So my name is Anne Rotzenert. I'm co-founder of Flexicon. Hi, Matthias. Hi, Anne. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. I'm Matthias Fung. I'm co-founder of UX Suite. And what we are going to do today is uh, I show you the agenda. We are going through um, the following um, topics. We start with a very quick introduction uh, of process mining. Some of you might be familiar with it, but for others, it's maybe a little bit more new. So we give a, a quick version of what process mining is in the first place. But then we go into the topic of uh, yeah the challenges that uh, you get once you apply process mining for customer journey analysis. And then um, at the end of the webinar, we are going to show you a live demo how customer journey analysis can be done through the combination of UX Suite and Disco. Um, and we show you really step by step uh, how this works and we show you a concrete scenario live in this webinar. And then at the end, uh, we have um, time for questions. Okay, so now let's get started. We start with a quick introduction into process mining. Process mining um, specifically addresses the problem that typically if you're talking about business processes, how they how they are running, you have a certain ideal process that's either documented or in the heads of the people who are working with the process, which is relatively structured. Um, you know, first you're doing this, then you're doing that, like shown on the left side here. But the problem is that in reality, processes are not always going according to plan. You have rework, there are things that are not going right the first time, so they have to be done again. Uh, you have multiple people who perform the same process in different ways. Um, so there's this discrepancy between the ideal process and how the process is really being performed. But um, even bigger of a problem is that usually we do not have any overview at all how the process is really uh, performed. And uh, why that's so difficult is here are some of the reasons we hear most frequently from people. Everyone has a subjective view on the process, depending on their specific role. Um, and then um, specifically for processes, there's never just one person involved in it, but there are multiple people who work um, yeah, in different uh, phases of the process. So everyone knows very well what they're doing, but yeah, have little understanding about what's happening before and afterwards in the process. And in addition, processes change all the time, either through external um, constraints or new reg regulations, for example, or internal restructuring. So all that leads to very poor visibility. Now, process mining really is about filling that gap. So uh, we can provide a picture of the actual process, how the process is really being performed. And that can then be a basis to compare the real process with the process as it should be and be the basis for process improvements, for example. How does it work? Very, very simple example shown here. Uh, you can see several activities are performed for different cases. So this is being recorded as data in the information system. It can be an ERP system, a workflow system, or as we will later see, also a website um, that customers can visit and go through. Now, this data is the starting point for process mining. And we take that. And inside the process mining tool, we are reconstructing the different um, flows that were performed. For example, if this is an ordering process, then the customer went through the steps A, B, C, D, E. So A is the customer orders the product, B, um, the customer pays, C, we're shipping the product, and so on and so forth. With um, customer number two, uh, we see a slightly different run through the same process. You see that C and B happened in a different order. So um, maybe that's the customer who we already know, and we um, know they will pay. So we ship the product before we've received the payment. And with the third variant, you see a repetition around activity D. So maybe we had to send out a proposal twice or something. Now, um, with process mining, we get these variants um, that are observed in reality out of the data, but we go one step further. We want to see how does the overall process look like. And if we do that just based on the first case, it's a very sequential process. But as soon as we incorporate the second one, we see that variation back in the process map. And with the third one, we get this little loop here around activity D. Right. And um, just to to give you a quick um, demonstration how that looks like in reality, I show you a quick demo um, before we go into the specific topic about process mining for customer journeys um, to show you how process mining works. So it's a, um, a simple example here of a purchasing process. We always need three types of uh, types of data. We need a case ID, an activity name, and a timestamp. And um, let's say we're responsible for that process and we received complaints about it. We want to understand how does it really work and can we find ways to make it more efficient. So 
this is Disco. Disco is our uh, process mining software. It stands for discovery. We are discovering the real process based on the actual data. So we are importing um, this file, and then we are making a mapping to these three minimum requirements that I mentioned. We are saying this is our activity name, this is the case ID, um, and we have the timestamp configured here. So once we've created that mapping, uh, we can start the import and without knowing anything about the process, just based on um, the historical data that we've seen, we can automatically visualize the process as it really took place. Right? And I'll explain to you how you can read this map here. At the top, you have a little triangle for um, that's the starting point of the process. And um, we see that there are 608 purchase orders in the data set that we imported. And all of them start with create purchase requisition as the first step. Now, afterwards, the process splits into two alternative paths. 374 times we're going this way, 234 times we're going this way. So the numbers, the thickness of the arrows and the coloring, they all reflect the frequency of how frequently certain parts of the process were used. And immediately we can see one very dominant loop here around activity, a meant request for quotation, which um, yeah, is an activity that should only happen in rare um, exceptional instances, but it happens more than 500 times for 608 cases. So it's an enormous waste that's going on here. That's a typical example of what you can find out uh, with process mining. Now, um, one of the challenges that you find in normal business processes um, quite quickly, but even more so, and we will get back to that later, in customer journey analysis is the complexity of the process. So reality becomes very complicated very quickly. and um, what we can do here in, in Disco is that we can simplify the process and it becomes very important once we are, uh, want to analyze and understand the process. And I'll show you in a moment why that's the case. So let's first simplify the process by pulling down the activity slider to the lowest point. In this case, we see the main process shown here with um, just the activities from the most frequent variant. So that's the main flow of the process, but then we can gradually bring in more of the details, more of the less frequently performed activities until at 100% uh, we see all of them. And then we can also um, yeah, show all of the paths that show then really like the um, each of the very small, also less frequently used parts uh, of the process. And I can show you another example um, to make that, yeah, to show why that's really needed. So this is like another process I'm having here. Uh, it's a customer service process. It doesn't really matter what kind of process this is, but this is a more realistic example because the purchasing process is quite a simple example there. It looks like a simple process, but actually um, this is a highly simplified version. If you would look at all of the paths and all of the different transitions that are possible in this process, you would get this kind of what we call spaghetti problem, right? So it's we call it spaghetti process map because it looks like a bowl of spaghetti and it's not that this problem that this process isn't the true process this is the process if you look at every level of level of detail all in one picture but it's not useful at all so we need ways to simplify the process and um, those simplification sliders in disco are the best way to do that because you still see all the also rare steps that happened um, but you can now generate really readable process maps that show the main flow through the process. Now, to complete the demo, I want to mostly show you or illustrate like how you work with such a process mining tool. It's not that you generate a picture and then you're done with it, uh, but this is really the starting point for process mining. It really enables a very interactive way of working where you can very quickly and very interactively just answer all kinds of questions that you have about the process. So for example, we said in the beginning that there were some complaints about the process. Let's say these complaints were about the throughput time, right? So what we can do very simply is we can, for example, look at the statistics, we can look at the case durations, and then we see that actually, well, most of the cases from the very start to the very end of the process, they take 16 or 17 days most, but there are some of them that are taking really long like 80 days and 90 days and more. So with process mining, we can very quickly just say, well, we want to focus on those and we want to find out, well, where are we actually losing so much time in the process? So we are adding a performance filter here to focus on those long running cases, uh, let's say 70 days and more. So just the blue ones are now the ones that we focus on. And then we see that's about 15% and we can apply the filter and then what happens is we see a little reminder here of those 15% in the lower left corner. Uh, so this is the process map now just for the 92 
of those 608 cases, the 15% that take longer than 70 days. And only for those, I now see the process map. And I can see, for example, that this rework loop is now even more dominant. I'm going now more than, yeah, on average, three times per case through this loop. That certainly has something to do with those long delays. But in this case, I can also look at the um, yeah, the mean duration, for example. I look at the, the waiting times in the process based on the timestamps that I get from the data. And then I see, well, not only am I going through this loop unnecessarily often, but um, the step itself doesn't take very long, but there's an enormous waiting time that's incurred here. So process mining enables that objective picture of what's really going on in the process, uh, where the problems are. You will have to go outside of the tool, outside of the data, speak to the people to find out why this is happening, but it shows you the reality and makes that possible and helps to communicate, right? And the last thing I show here in terms of communication, um, also the, the animation is really important because what this helps us is to show and make really visible uh, what we found in our analysis to for example, external stakeholders who should actually change perhaps or help us um, do something with this process based on the analysis that we found. And so what you see here is a um, similar view as before, but now a replay um, over time. So every yellow dot is one case. It's one purchase order moving through the process. And um, yeah, so this is not an, a simulation, but really a replay of the actual process. And what it does, it, it makes it very tangible, really easy to see and very easy to discuss um, as a process that's really moving through um, as, it, as it really happens. Now, that's um, the way and the power of process mining, right? That you see you have data and automatically you visualize the process and you show um, yeah, the magical process map and the, the animation. And you can very quickly answer all kinds of questions uh, based on performance, but also um, you can find uh, compliance deviations. You can take different views. So all that um, is, is really powerful. Um, at the same time, uh, you also get some challenges. So uh, I want to talk a little bit more about yeah some of the examples. I have three quick examples um, in the um, yeah, space of process mining for customer journeys. And well, when we are talking about customer journeys, then um, the key difference here to the more traditional ways of analyzing processes of process mining is that the perspective of the customer is taken, right? If you're looking at an administrative process or purchasing process, then you're looking at it from the inside of the company, but not that's not the way that the customer perceives the process. The customer has certain interactions with the company, um, in different instances. And that's the view and the process that companies nowadays are more and more looking to take and to, to optimize because that's the key different, yeah, a key differentiator. If you have very good uh, services for the customers, then they will be, uh, they will stick around. They will um, tell other people about how, how great the company is. So more and more processes are oriented from that perspective. And so there are three examples I want to show. And the first one is actually one a rather old one. It's maybe, it may be the earliest example of process mining for customer journeys. Uh, that's um, still from our time at the Technical University. You see, this is a, the usability lab of the Technical University in Eindhoven. And um, it was um, a us usability lab that was used for, for example, for tests of different um, yeah, modern um, electronics devices. So here it's a, it's a TV that's being tested and people have to go through certain exercises and um, they are videotaped and everything is recorded. And then afterwards people evaluate um, how, how well they did and how usable the, 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 the products are. Now, this one experiment that was done was about a television where uh, people had to go through um, you know, certain tasks. And one of the tasks was about um, it's called the dual screen task. It was about um, showing one program on the TV and then at the same time, a second program in the in the upper right corner so that you're basically watching two programs at the same time. What you see here is the ideal task sequence to achieve that task. And um, people um, actually started this. And then if you look at the actual process that they followed, it looked like this, right? And what's really nice to see is, for example, here uh, you see how uh, how they're going back to the main menu, right? So the main menu, you, maybe you know that from yourself. Uh, you try to do something at the TV or the video recorder or something. Um, and if you don't find your way, then 
well, you go to the main menu and you try to find your way back. So that's what you see happening. You see people wandering around, uh, getting lost. And what this helps is understanding, uh, looking at where they get lost and how they are finding their way back helps then as a next step to start improving the usability of the product. And well, the nice thing about this particular experiment was that actually they uh, had two groups of participants, participants who self-identified as particularly, um, yeah, um, they are familiar with technology and computers and so on. And then the group that said, well, I don't know much about computers. And this is the group that said, uh, well, I'm familiar with computers. So the group that said, I'm not so familiar with computers is shown here. And some of them didn't finish the task at all. There was a timeout at some point in time. Uh, so, well, what you can see here is that usability, improving the usability um, is, the, is the central theme of that kind of analysis. And the same can be done, this was a television here in a usability test, but the same can be done with websites. And more and more companies are now those looking at how are people actually navigating through my website. And uh, one of the examples I have here is um, an analysis that was presented by Ellen van Molle and Pam van Schroenwinkel at um, an event that we organized in the Netherlands around customer journey analysis for process mining. And I have just one slide here that, from their presentation where they show uh, how the sign up flow was at a website for one of the, their clients that they that they were analyzing and you can see the, the thick blue line here where um, yeah ideally the customers who are signing up for that website which was about um, people who were looking for a job and matching them to available jobs um, on that uh, yeah job marketplace site so ideally you want people to sign up and to completely end um, go through the whole registration flow. But what you can see is that there's a lot of drop off points here and people drop off in various stages. So yeah, analyzing the way people are going through the site and where they drop off can then help to form hypothesis and improve the usability of the site and then to afterwards check whether that's actually improving um, yeah, the, the rate of the people or the number of people that make it towards the end. And another um, example that I have here is from uh, Frank van Reffen. He presented that at the Pros Mining Camp last year. And the Pros Mining Camp is a practitioner Pros Mining conference that we organize every year in Eindhoven. Um, and it's taking place again on 15th June. So you can we can include the link in the follow-up email to this, uh, to this webinar. So you can take a look and come if you can make it. Uh, so it's really practitioners sharing challenges and uh, also yeah, experiences about their process mining efforts. So he talked about several projects they did. And one of them was about a cross-channel mortgage customer journey analysis. And what you see here is, um, yeah, often indeed customer journey processes are running across multiple channels. So here you have different channels. One is the bank itself where people can make appointments and get advice from uh, someone about this particular mortgage, but also online. Um, there is a certain portal where people can use as kind of a self-assessment tool to fill in certain information about their um, the mortgage they're looking for, some information about their income, and then they get some assessment back uh, how you know what kind of mortgage they could get. So um, they're interested in that whole process that those customers go through, and specifically they were interested in three kind of questions. First of all, they wanted to know like how many people find this kind of self-assessment site already through the online channels compared to being sent there directly from uh, someone uh, at the bank. And then they wanted to look at the self-assessment tool itself, like how easy was it to use, how well were people able to uh, use it, and then how long did it take to actually make that appointment in the end. Now, what, um, what he explained then also is exactly what I already also um, mentioned. is like a challenge that you find uh, even more in customer journeys than in any other process is the spaghetti problem. Uh, processes um, that customers go through at a website are not at all um, the same for for the same uh, for different people, but everyone basically goes through different paths. So there's a lot of diversity. It's not like um, you're applying for a passport and everyone you know goes through those exact same steps. So that poses a challenge and. Uh, you can do a lot on the process mining side. So he showed like by focusing the analysis and basically focusing on certain questions that you have, you can actually uh, really well also answer those questions and really um, 
use process mining successfully. So it's possible, but um, there are even better ways to do it. And um, the data preparation is, is key to that. And that's exactly um, what we want to show you uh, in, in the remainder of this webinar. So uh, the challenges specifically for customer journey analysis um, with process mining is three different challenges. The first one is, well, combining and preparing the data. Well, actually getting the data in the first place is uh, often the first challenge um, um, as the first step. So let's assume, let's say you have a website um, and that's the website that you would like to observe uh, how people are using the website. So how do you get that data? And this is, um, as a first step, this is really something that UX Suite um, focuses on and makes really easy. So they have an out of the box solution um, to give you uh, data from how people are navigating a website. Um, and uh, we will show that later, how we can use that for Disco. But uh, it's more than just getting some data out of uh, how people are using the website. It's actually, it turns out that you need data on very different levels. So if we look at, um, for example, um, yeah, this scenario here, then we see that on the one hand side, you want to see how people are navigating the website. How are they going through the different pages, going through the menus uh, from page to page? So that's the navigation piece. And that's something that, um, yeah, you, that's what you get out of the box if you get your data with the uh, UX suite instrumentation. But then there are different layers as well. For example, you may want to look at more detailed um, um, actions, for example, if someone is actually um, moving around on the site, clicking on on things, or um, yeah, hovering over things, interacting with the site in certain areas, that's yeah the much more detailed interaction layer, and that's also something um, that you can collect the data on uh, with the UX Suite data collection. And then um, you want to look at user clusters, so in the sense that different types of people um, are yeah, similar and other types of people are not so similar. And that's meant in terms of behavior or maybe also location or certain criteria, but especially the behavior component, right? You can see people who are maybe looking for something. Um, they are more informing themselves and going through certain steps. They're reading everything. And then there might be people who know already what they want and they're just searching for something very specific. You will see different behavioral patterns and um, you can prepare and group and um, yeah, bring the data to a semantic level that makes the analysis easier. And then the last piece is that you actually want to look at the whole, um, yeah, really the, the customer journey also not just for one specific session, uh, but also for yeah, multiple sessions across multiple sessions. Um, and also you, you may want to bring in additional data sources like we've seen before in this mortgage uh, process example. Um, there may be additional data sources in the company, for example, about actual actual visits uh, to a certain branch or maybe um, calls to the call center from the CRM system. That should that should be integrated to really get like the overall view on on the process. Now that's the the first piece. So let's say, for example, you have that website and you want to do process mining analysis with it. Really look at the process flows in Disco. Now. Um, that's, that's the first challenge, getting the data and preparing it. Now, UX Suite makes this really easy because they have built that integration through the Disco Airlift interface, which uh, we will show you in a moment, really gets you the data out of the box in a very easy way. Uh, so that's the first piece, but then we're coming to the second problem. So we're, we're back with the spaghetti problem that we discussed before. And the spaghetti problem really has two dimensions. The first dimension is the complexity of the process itself. And um, I've shown you before like how really processes can become very complex that like if you're looking at everything in one picture, it becomes very big and, and like uh, unusable. And there are different strategies that you can use. And Disco is really the best uh, process mining tool on the market to deal with complex processes and can deal with complex processes very well. And there are different things you can do, different strategies you can take on the process analysis side. However, if you're looking at customer journey processes, then you find that there's 
another dimension to that because you actually need to iterate as well on the data itself. You need to, you may need to adapt the data, maybe rename, remap them, group the data in in certain way, and um, that means that, well, in in the combination um, of your X suite and Disco, you can actually achieve that. And the power here is that, well, not only are you going through this integration in a one-way step, it's not that you're importing the data and then you're done, but actually you may see certain things in the analysis, in the process mining analysis in Disco, that then lead to the fact that you want to modify the data. And normally you have to then go to the to the raw data and with large data sets that can be quite a challenge. Well, through this integration, you can now go back um, and actually do some changes to the way that the data is connected in your X suite, um, refine the data or say you want to collect more fine-grained data, uh, group the data, bring it to semantic level and import again. And um, so what that means is that it really gives power to the analyst because the analyst is the person who does, uh, who has the, uh, the knowledge about the kind of analysis that is needed and about the process that should be improved. And that's actually the power that we see for process mining um, in the first place. So if we look at this spectrum um, to look at how accessible certain tools are to business users, then what we find is that there are reports and dashboards, for example, that are really accessible for business users, but they're also very limited. They're quite restricted, right? So they only show exactly what was pre-programmed for them to show. Um, well, Excel is very powerful, a very popular tool for business users, uh, among business users, and not without reason, because it's really powerful. You can do a lot with Excel, but it's still something that, um, yeah, for example, a process owner or business user can use themselves. On the other end of the spectrum, you have extremely powerful tools, custom development, but also all the big data tools um, that um, data scientists are using. But you really need to be an engineer or a data scientist to, to be able to do that. Now, process mining is, um, yeah, so powerful, so much more powerful for analyzing processes compared to Excel, for example, specifically because you have that um, sequence of steps components in a process. So in Excel, it's becoming really difficult to analyze processes because there are multiple steps that belong in one case. Process mining makes it very easy, but at the same time, really keeps it accessible to the people who are doing the, the process analysis, to the, to the process manager and to the process analyst who can interpret those results and really interactively um, answer all kinds of questions. And that's also how we like to see our Disco users. They're basically, process mining gives them kind of superpowers to um, do what they do already very well, but much easier in, an, in a much better way. And the key to this integration between Disco and UX Suite is that those kind of superpowers and this ability or autonomy of that analyst is not just, yeah, not just extended to the process analysis, but it really involves now and includes now the data um, simplification part as well. So you can go through this this loop and you can decide, for example, to now refine the data, to uh, group the data, and you can do that directly as an analyst in an autonomous way without going to IT or someone who does this for you. And then you can go back and analyze the new data and you can do that again and, ad and again just by yourself. So that's really the power of the integration that we see. And we will demo that to you in a moment uh, with the demo scenario that we have at the end of the webinar. The last challenge that I also want to mention is that often, of course, Different people have different needs. They have different perspectives. They're on different levels. And if you think of uh, websites, for example, then um, you have the technical perspective where people who are developing um, the site, they have more technical questions. They want to see how long um, certain pages take to load uh, because that can be the reason that people leave earlier. Uh, or they want to see whether there are any error messages and all. And then there are people that are really looking yeah, at the user experience or the um, yeah, the customer journey really from from a, from a from a process perspective, and then you have different business people who are looking at it from maybe an even higher level. Now, the advantage then of this combina uh, combination here is that um, everyone, every person, whether it's a UX person or a developer, uh, they can have their own level of data um, 
collection and data preparation that they can define for themselves. So they can look at the process in a very high level way or in a very detailed way. And these different profiles and kind of data views, they can be maintained and um, yeah, kept for, for, for everyone on the right level of detail. Okay, so what we want to do now is to show you all of this uh, in a live demo. Uh, and what we are um, using to do that is we have a, a site uh, that we made. It's not a real site, it's a demo site. We, we made that specifically for this particular demo to show you really the steps one by one. Um, so you can really understand how it works. Um, so it's, um, uh, it's this uh, hypothetical loan application site that um, yeah, offers you to apply for a loan. It shows that there are different types of loans. For example, here we can see that there's real estate financing and automobile loan and corporate loans. So we will, uh, we can then say we are interested in that and we can click the apply button. And uh, I'll show that to you right now. Um, we will show the demo in four phases. So we will go through this use case uh, four times and show you different aspects of it piece by piece. The first one is that we show that First of all, there is this tracking that you can get out of the box um, through the integration of a UX suite and Disco. In the second step, we will extend the events for deeper insight. We will make more fine-grained data collection and look at the result. Then we will start to go the other way and say, well, we have too much detailed information. We will actually group that and make more high-level uh, information from it. And then in the end, we will show you how we can also use real-time patterns that we have learned in the analysis uh, to trigger real action, real-time actions on the website itself. So we start with the, um, activating the events tracking and basically starting to analyze your own website with uh, process mining is really easy. So to activate that, all you need is really to add a very small script, a JavaScript to the website, and then um, the, the tracking is enabled. So that's what we did for this demo website that we are using here for the live demo. And then one thing you have to decide as well, of course, is for any process mining analysis, you have to decide what's the case. Um, do you want to see the, the visitor or do you want to look at sessions? And when do you think a session is starting and when is it ended? Um, depending on the kind of analysis that you do, there can be different answers to that and um, the analyst can um, decide that for themselves. Um, but for the purpose of the demo here, we have uh, a case assigned as a session. So we're looking at sessions and we have a timeout after two minutes. So if for two minutes, I'm not doing anything on the website, then a new case is being is being started. But that's just for this demo. You could um, analyze it in a different way. Okay, so let's get started. So Matthias and I will now uh, show you this demo together. And uh, the first thing that we're doing is that we are going through the website. So I'm opening the site. So this is the um, the loan application website that I have here. Make it a little bit bigger. So what we see is we have these different types of loans. So for example, I could click on this and I can say, well, okay, I'm really interested in real estate um, financing loans. So I read about it. I say, okay, I want to, I want to apply for a loan. So I click this apply button and then I can choose from these three different types of loans. So I'm interested in the real estate loan. So I'm clicking on this continue button. And then I have to provide information about the kind of object that I'm looking for to get a loan. So for example, uh, I can type some information here. So I'm just making something up right now. Um, maybe I'm not adding anything here. Maybe I'm thinking about what I should add. Maybe uh, I add some information here. Maybe I choose not to provide this. And then, for example, salary, let's just say provide 4,000, for example. And maybe I have 20,000 um, to start the loan. So I provide this information. Then I say continue. And I provide my contact details. Um, say I'm Mary. And then I say finish. And that's the demo scenario what, that we are using. As you can see, it's, it's a very simple one, but it's enough to illustrate um, the use case uh, and the interaction points that we want to show. Now, because this website is integrated um, already with UX Suite, so this JavaScript snippet that I showed you on the slides is already built into the site, we actually have the possibility to, out of the box, get um, the data into Disco. And uh, what I haven't shown you 
yet. So far, I've shown you the CSV import, which is the most lightweight and most flexible way to get data into uh, our process mining software. But there is um, another option as well, where you can, rather than importing a file, you can get the data directly from a server. And um, that's happening through the airlift um, interface. So that's a connection, um, an interface that's being defined for Disco. Um, so it's a standardized way to get data into Disco from a remote server. And uh, um, UX Suite has in implemented that interface and built an integration. And we have, an, uh, um, we have this demo uh, running on this server. And I will show you. Um, what it, what it does. So the first time you are connecting to the server, you have to provide those login details. Um, and then we connect. And what we get now is a list of the data sets. So we could have, for example, different processes or different uh, sites here in the in our catalog. So we call it the catalog of the data sets that are available. And this is the, the data for the test site. I see some overview information about the number of cases, the number of events, and so on. And uh, well, what I'm doing now is I'm focusing, I can say, well, which time frame do I want to analyze? I could say, for example, the data from the past month, or um, so I can choose which time frame I want. So in this case, um, I want to focus just on the data that I just generated. So I choose the time frame to start just before we started the webinar. So once I press download and analyze, uh, I'll actually out of the box, as you can see, I can get exactly the sequence of steps uh, that I just went through on the website. So this is the case that we just produced by walking through the steps on the website that I showed to you. And we can also look at the case here. So these are the timestamps uh, when we did that. So you see 18, 36, uh, 37. So this is exactly the sequence that we did. Now, imagine that, yeah, so first of all, that's that's really nice, right? You don't have to think about how you get the data from the website. This is the page titles. You could also have URLs, but this is the page titles at the moment. So that's the out of the box integration that you get. But let's say now we are going to the second step and we say, well, actually, we would like to see some more detailed information about which elements on the sites I have clicked or maybe brought into focus or um, navigated around with. So in order to make that happen, I now move over to Matthias, who will show us how we can actually create some more detailed logging uh, on the UX suite side. So what we've shown before is basically the, the simple integration that shows pages. And um, the interesting thing is that with this little snippet of JavaScript, that's the only thing that you have to do in the code itself. All the rest can be done in our uh, UX suite studio software, which I will show you now. So now if you remember back the, this pyramid of, of different data layers, we've seen so far the red layer of the page flow. What I'm going to show you now is how to move down to the interaction layer to really see all the little events that happen on uh, the user uh, browser level. So what I'm going to do is I will um, activate a new pattern that is running live on our service. And this new pattern um, uh, will do the following. And I will actually move now to the web tracking. And this is um, um, a, a point and click interface where you can actually click on the elements in the form pages and instrument them for tracking. So I have prepared this before. So you see a list of different things that I'm tracking automatically. And the interesting thing is I can really go for every single page element. I can go for form elements, pictures, videos, anything. And I can also track different elements and uh, different actions on these elements. So for instance, for form elements, it's extremely interesting to look at what kind of data is entered, how the data is changed, and how people jump between form elements. And this is what I can see with this kind of instrumentation. Now I'm going to activate this. And then we, uh, Anna will, will show you how, uh, how actually the website reacts to that in Disco. Okay. I'm activating. I'm back to you, Anna. Okay. Uh, so I'll go through exactly the same scenario once again. So I'm going back to the, to the home page. Let's say we're still we're running through exactly the same sequence. So we're looking at the page. We're seeing there are different types of loans. So I'm clicking on this one, for example, to see. Um, that um, what is descri described here and I say well I'm interested in this real estate financing loan so I say apply now then I choose the right type of loan that I'm interested in so I'm saying well I want 
to know more about those real estate loans. So then I get to that uh, site where I have to provide all that information. So this is exactly what we just instrumented. So now I'm not just seeing that I am on that site, but I will be able to see um, detailed things that I'm doing here, like that I'm providing um, data and that I'm even bringing them into focus or out of focus so I can define, as you've seen in the interface, in a, in a what you see is what you get way, what kind of actions do I want to track, just the click or so getting into focus, getting out of focus. So I'm wandering around a little bit here, um, specifying other elements, um, giving some information going back and forth. So now all of these kind of detailed actions that I'm doing, moving through those forms, because we were interested in seeing that on a more detailed level, um, this should now show up uh, in our process flow in, in, a, in, in a more detailed way. So we've again finished by providing our contact data and then finalizing our session on this um, website. So now again, what we're doing is we can go to Disco and again, we are going to the test site. And um, what we're again doing is we're focusing on the time frame that we're looking for. So more or less the time of the webinar here today. And now I say download and analyze. And now I can see there are two cases. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. Um, so if I zoom in like this, then we see, well, we have two cases now, right? So uh, we can also see the two cases here. So there are these two sessions. And the second one is much more detailed. We see all these detailed events um, that were not generated in the first session where we only saw the, the different um, pages that we went through. So here we have all these detailed information. And in the map, we can see it as well. For example, uh, going from this start home page to the, uh, to the first where we select the loan we see that we actually clicked on this real estate open drawer so that's one of the things um, that we instrumented with the to listen for the click of it we see the click was there and then we see the different form elements with uh, focus and so getting in of focus getting out of focus and you saw this loop how i was wandering around there so we see this is becoming now much more detailed and we really see on a much more detailed level how the process was followed. At the same time, once you start really looking at the process in a very detailed level, it, it becomes very, well, it, more and more spaghetti very quickly, right? So, well, this is actually still just these two cases, but perhaps, I don't know, we can just look at taking some more of the previous sessions as well. So if we look at that, you can see, well, it yeah, we're getting um, some more complex almost spaghetti process maps quite quickly. So one of the steps, once you have the detailed information, is often that you want to um, yeah, look at it in, more, uh, in a more semantically grouped way. So you have certain things, for example, let's say these um, detailed events that we have in those form actions, we would like to group them. We would like to see that they are happening. But uh, as a next step, we would like to just have them show up as one kind of granular action telling us that there was some kind of form activity, but not differentiate this level of detail that we have at the moment. So that's the scenario uh, that we go through now in the third step. Uh, and I'll go give back the screen to Matthias to show us how to do it. Okay, wonderful. So now we're back and now I'm going to show you how we map these different kind of small interaction events to a common event. I'm going to into this live pattern and all these patterns are actually running in our servers. So they influence the data collection in real time. Now what I'm going to do is you see here these blue boxes and these are specifically generated for the small interaction events. Now what I can do is I can simply create a new event and this new event is clustering all form actions. Okay. Now what you see here all these blue boxes are connected to a, a common outlet. And this outlet leads directly to the database and then eventually to Disco. Now what I can do, I can, I can redirect this and map all these small events to form actions. This takes a little bit. Yes, there we go. Okay. And now I connect it back. And now you see it shows already in the data flow that certain events here, the, these are the form action events, they are mapped to a form actions event. 
and they, this clusters all these small events. But I leave the real estate action that you have seen. Uh, it's, it's basically a click on the first page opening this drawer. I leave that unchanged. So we still want to have that in our flow. Now the thing is, I just save this and Anna can go again through the site to show the changes. Okay. So now I'm again going through the same demo scenario. So we start with the with the start page. We are clicking on the draw. We are interested in the real estate financing, reading what it is about. Okay, we want to go on. So um, I'm again pressing the apply now button and I'll choose the loan that I'm interested in. And now on this site, again, we are providing information. And like you've seen, we have now um, yeah, clustered those or abstracted it in a way that we don't see every little field that is being changed here. But I still see um, that I'm moving around, uh, but I'm just seeing that I'm doing something in this form. So that's uh, the grouping there that Matthias just showed um, that, was, that was being done. And we can provide other information that we provided before. Um, and maybe move around a little bit more. And then we can complete the form. We say continue. Uh, we again provide our contact details and we finish the demo scenario. So let, let's now look at the kind of data that comes out in Disco once I import um, the new data. So again, I go back to the, um, to the Airlift server and I choose the time frame of the session. Um, so Again, I click download and analyze, and now I see three uh, cases. So this is the third run through the demo scenario. So this is the third case, and we see how um, I have going have been going through the process. So I'll make all of the path visible because well, we can still do that, and we can exactly see the differences also of the kind of logging that we produced by the changes that we made to the way the data is collected. So first of all, we are start always with the start page. But then um, in the first instance, we just ran through directly. And for the second and the third one, we actually registered this more detailed action of that we clicked on that real estate drawer. But then on the second um, or the third page, um, 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 you see all these different form actions where we provide our data. And in the first case, we actually went through, that's the middle scenario here, we went directly through the appointment page. So there's no detail at all. Uh, on the left side, you see all those very detailed actions from the second run through where we registered um, yeah, which kind of field became into focus, out of focus, what was done. So we have like a very detailed view here on this left side. And on the right side, we now see like this scenario that we just went through. We see that there did things happen. So we have uh, information. We see also how frequently uh, we did these actions that we have here in detail, but we have them grouped um, onto one label called form actions. So it's much less noisy and um, much less complicated, the kind of process map that we are grouping, um, that we are getting based on that. And so what you can see um, is that through the combination and through the analysis and the possibility to go back and adapt the kind of data collection to the level that you need it, you really get this fast feedback loop and that iterative way of working um, all in a completely autonomous way that the analysts themselves can actually influence the analysis that they want to do. And so that brings us to the last step of the demo where we want to show one more thing where actually once you have found certain patterns in the process um, that can actually lead to certain questions, for example, you see customers behaving in a certain way, you can use that knowledge to define certain patterns based on behavior of the people navigating through the site to trigger certain actions on the website itself. So let's assume um, that we see that people are often using those drawers and clicking on that. And it occurs to us, well, actually, um, if they do that, they express already some kind of interest in this type of loan. So maybe we can, admit, we can make it easier for them on the next page where they have to choose which loan they should get. And we could show them some kind of custom version, customized version of the website based on the behavior and the interest that they have shown previously. Um, so this is um, the last thing that Matthias will show us. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So what I'm going to show you is uh, now to basically a bonus feature to react automatically on things that happen live on the website. So imagine that you've discovered a pattern or you just discovered a certain cluster of user 
that you would like to give a different experience on the website or you would like to uh, give a different navigation path through the website, this is what you can do with this feature. So what I'm going to do is I will deactivate the current uh, events tracking and I will activate a new pattern. And this pattern is very simple but actually very powerful. What you see here is basically the blue things again are events. Now the first thing is a real estate um, event. So this is a click on this real estate drawer that you saw on the first page of the website. Yeah. So whenever this, this is clicked, there's an event generated. And what we do here is we add a semantic labeling on top. So we label this event as real estate interest. And the interesting thing is this kind of label is preserved for this session, but also for this user for a long amount of time. So even if the user quits the session and um, resumes the journey at some later point, this kind of interest will be captured still, and we can still make um, adjustments based on this interest. Now, the second event that we're capturing is the loan selection. This is a page that is basically the second page in the flow after you click on the apply button on the first page. So this, this um, will illustrate the following. So in the moment that someone on the first page will actually click on the real estate drawer and open it, we label this user as uh, someone who is interested in real estate. And once this person goes to the second page, we will display or we will highlight the real estate loan option for them. Okay, how does that work? Um, we are using a special processing block here. This is the gray block in the middle. I open it and you have a lot of processing options here, but this one actually looks at the order of events. And if events happen in a certain order, then the next part of the data flow is triggered. So what we see here is that the first event comes via a route called interest and the second comes via a route called page. And this is exactly what happens here. So the first arrow is labeled interest and the second arrow on the right side is labeled page. So once an event comes through the interest arrow and then another event comes through the page arrow, then this block triggers and it triggers actually an action. This is the, the red triangle at the bottom. And this action does something very simple because in this case is very simple. It will uh, execute a little piece of JavaScript code on the website. But executing JavaScript code can mean anything on a website. So it can be incredibly powerful. You can trigger all kinds of different changes, buttons, widgets, and so on. And in this simple case, we're going to simply address um, one element in the HTML, which is labeled real estate with an ID. And this is using jQuery to do that. And we will add a class, a CSS class, to style it with a yellow background. Yeah? So that's a very simple thing that we trigger when um, events happen in a certain order. So the only thing I have to do now, I have to activate this. And I give back the screen to Anna, and she will show you. Now you should be able to see my screen again. And I again will go through that scenario. I'll start at the beginning. And now we are going to trigger that specific behavioral pattern that Matthias um, defined there by opening this drawer that we, like we did in the same way as we did before. So we are opening it and therefore showing our interest in this part of the uh, of type of loan. So uh, once I've done that and now I'm going to the next page, I'm triggering going to trigger the order pattern and that will trigger the, um, the action. And the action, as you can see here, is uh, triggering this yellow background, uh, highlighting that loan that uh, we now think is more interesting for the user having shown some interest before by clicking on the loan draw, real estate loan draw, making it easier for them uh, to choose the right option for them. And so you can see this was um, just live based on the change that Matthias did. We influenced the behavior of the site. There can be other things. There can be surveys being launched based on um, specific patterns. So what you see is that even more than analyzing the data and pre-processing and grouping the data. Um, if you're interested in that, you can even, um, yeah, on the website itself, influence the way uh, it is presented based on the behavior that people uh, have, have shown. So this concludes the demo scenario. We, we, we conclude the presentation and then we go to the, the Q&A uh, session. So uh, we want to recap, come back to the challenges that exist specifically in the space of 
yeah, customer journey analysis with process mining. First of all, uh, we talked about the challenge of getting the data in the first place and then combining and preparing it. So uh, what you can see here is that um, by the combination of Disco and UX Suite, this is really working out of the box in a very easy way. Um, furthermore, uh, We've talked about the multiple channels that are often involved in a customer journey analysis. At this scenario, we focused really on this one uh, channel, uh, the website data collection only, but you can pull in and integrate different data sources like uh, the CRM system or other data sources uh, on the UX suite side as well and look at the overall customer journey in, in very much the same way. Well, the second challenge that we talked about was the complexity of the processes and the spaghetti problem. Now, Disco is already uh, the most powerful tool for complex processes uh, um, to simplify them and to analyze them from a process mining perspective. But you do have that data dimension and the need to influence and change um, the way the data is collected. And the combination of Disco and UX Suite gives the analyst the full autonomy uh, to really analyze the whole customer journey in this um, iterative analysis cycle that um, is most effective and really brings you to the solution um, um, in, in the most, um, yeah, in the, in the quickest and most powerful way without having to go back to let other people do data transformations for you and so on and so forth. Um, and then at the third um, the third point was that we have different perspectives. And like we mentioned before, every user can store their own kind of data patterns, their own, um, their own analysis views. And this is something that will change over the time as well because different projects will focus on different kinds of questions. So um, yeah, that's, that's something that everyone for themselves can maintain. So UX Suite and Disco together really make this possible. Um, here you see the advantages uh, once again on one picture. And what we really want you to do is to um, yeah, try this for yourself. Um, do you have a website that you would like to analyze uh, with process mining? Um, we would like you to make this, uh, yeah, to try this out and to do this, make this as simple as possible. Contact us with any questions that you have uh, also after the, the webinar, but we are also now looking at whether there were any questions um, and um, answer them right now. But like I just said, if there are things that you think of later, or if you want to talk to any of, of us here, you have the direct contact information of Matthias and myself. Um, and I'll, I'll leave this on while we are looking at the questions. Okay, I have one question. Okay, I read it loud out. So one question is based on the examples and the whole explanation, can we say that process mining is a good opportunity to have testing for software development? It would show errors, performance problems and not used modules things. Absolutely. And this is uh, really one of the use cases and one of the but the type of um, yeah customer journey analysis teams or the type of people who would do this kind of customer journey analysis is the people who are actually developing the website because they have to see how people are navigating and on the one hand side usability uh, questions are relevant there but at the same time really hard performance problems like how long does a website to uh, to load are really relevant there and you can do this performance analysis with disco in a, in a process oriented way and that's absolutely one of the use cases this is um, very suitable for. Yeah, maybe to add to that, um, due to the real-time processing capabilities of this combination, you can do all kinds of A-B testing, split testing scenarios on the fly and actually um, direct the users everywhere you want or present them with different content, different styling, different um, separations of content and so on. So this is, this is actually built in and you can analyze any kind of result from from these testing sessions in Disco, which is pretty amazing. I think no one else can do that. Okay, great, thank you. Well, one other question, uh, Matthias, maybe you can also add to that. There's one question where um, it is asked whether we can explain how this is different from other tools, like for example, Optimizely for A-B testing. And I know that, uh, I mean, I know Optimizely, so it's, um, it's a website where you can um, in, a, in a visual way design, let's say, different versions of a website, like version A and version B, and then you can run tests and show different people different versions and see, you know, which ones do better. But I know that you sometimes refer to this as basically we are doing A-B testing for customer journeys. Isn't that right? Yeah, sometimes you could refer to that, but I think uh, what, what this combination offers is much broader than that. And um, it's, it's far beyond testing, and it's actually moving towards giving operational support to 
um, the running business and not, not just uh, the testing period, but really um, doing things continuously. I think that is a very important point that, that we support the business um, and, and the, the customer um, experience process uh, as a moving target. Uh, it, it is always moving and you, you're never done with that. So I think that's, that's a very important point. It's not just about testing and then finding a local maximum. It's really about chasing after the best possible customer experience. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, there's one other question, um, which is about, could you expand a bit more on relevant techniques for trace and or user clustering in relation to process mining on customer journeys? That's a good point. So trace, for um, those of you who don't know that, trace clustering is uh, one of the yeah, one of the areas uh, within the broader space of process mining techniques that there is where people are actually looking at the individual traces and sequences. And then there's some clustering being applied to those traces first. And then for those different groups of um, uh, of traces, then separate models can be discovered. So there's research about that, um, for example, in the PROM, in the academic PROM tool, PROM framework. Well, I would say um, that can that's complementary and that can be used as well. So if you're using trace clustering on the process mining side, for example, from Disco, you can easily export the data in uh, one of the XML-based um, event log formats and then go to PROM, do some trace clustering algorithms, more some more um, things like that. And then the insights that you get um, then about like how, yeah, what kind of groups of people you have, you can use that again, um, come back to your data collection and then start creating those groups of people based on those patterns. So that's that's something that that um, yeah can be done directly in Disco based on the direct analysis by seeing the patterns. But if you're using like data mining te based techniques like trace clustering, that can be complemented as well and it fits fits in this. Um, so let's see, there are some more questions coming in. So that's great. So let's look at the next one. Um, very interesting. OK, great. Thank you get some feedback as well. Um, yeah, so there was one question whether this webinar is going to be available for later viewing. Um, some people were coming in later and missed something. So we will send the slides. Um, we tried to make a recording. We will see whether that worked and whether we can share the recording. We will try to do so, but we can't promise. Um, we will share the slides. So otherwise, um, you can always contact us and um, let us know and, and we can yeah, explain to you some things that you have missed. Um, um, there's another question about like a rule of thumb for the amount of cases. Um, that's a good question. Well, it's just in general in process mining, um, one rule of thumb. So the question is like whether, yeah, how many cases do we need basically to do a good analysis? Um, one rule of thumb in process mining is that you have to look at the, um, basically the average throughput time of like an expected case. For example, if you have a process that's running yeah, five days, maybe it's the expected five business days the, the process takes to complete. Then, for example, the rule of thumb gives you, um, let this like a simple formula, it gives you like three months of data. Um, if you don't have a better way to find out how much data you need, then you, you should take three months of data, which gives you a good set of uh, processes that were run through the complete process. Um, in, in contrast, if you have a process that takes several months, um, then yeah, you with three months of data, you would not have one complete instance. So that would be not enough data. Well, with um, customer journeys, then it depends on the scope of the customer journey that you're looking at. If you're just looking at sessions, uh, it can be actually quite short. And maybe even if you just take one day for a high volume website, you could already see some good and representative behavior. But if you're looking, for example, at such a loan application process where people are informing themselves, maybe later on calling again, making appointments, and you want to look over that whole process, actually it can take weeks or months as well. So that is influencing mostly here the decision on this on the scope okay let's look there's two more questions at the moment um the question is <clears throat> this kind of scenario can prove to be an analog uh, yeah analogous for e-commerce websites i guess and also in operational research for predictive analytics so I, I do think it's for for e-commerce websites it's particularly interesting because of course they um yeah, they have directly something to sell. So the, the more this moves towards an order process, um, that's interesting. But it's not just for um, for e-commerce websites. Is, Matthias, do you have any 
any more like examples of maybe non-e-commerce websites where this is relevant? Customer service, for example, right? Yes, there are a couple of customer service cases that also we have done before where we worked um, in the field of um, reducing, for instance, the, the costs for call centers and uh, reducing the overall cost of providing the customer service. But I can imagine all kinds of other um, um, cases. For instance, e-learning could be very interesting um, the, to, to look at the retention of students in e-learning cases or um, MOOCs, for instance. Um, that's that's definitely also very interesting. But but what I would like to add to the e-commerce case is that if you have um, if you have a high volume of, of transactions, then it's very interesting to also experiment with um, real life influencing these. And the interesting thing is that you can directly put a value to any kind of action or intervention, and then you could even explore new business models with that. So the interesting thing is that we measure before and we measure after an inter intervention automatically. And then um, you can really show and prove the, the uplift in business potentially. Okay? So I think e-commerce is one of the very, very interesting areas for this. Mm. Yes. OK, great. The next question I think is directly for you, Matthias. The question is, how does data go to the UX suite service from the web browser or from the web server? Can I use this in intranets, for example? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, well, we have a lot of experience with also acquiring data from other sources. And um, one thing for interweb or inter intranets is that we can, of course, run the service on your kind of intranet. That's no problem. So we have enterprise plans for, for doing that. And then the, the, the data is really kept on site. Um, but the other thing is also that we offer all kinds of APIs that you can stream the data into. And we even offer SDKs for integrating data collection into mobile applications, for instance, or desktop applications, or even tangible products. So um, a, a true cross-channel um, data collection is, is very easily possible um, with this combination. OK, thank you. On the next question um, is, do you have some tools to automate some basic analysis? Something like, every day I want to see the main path through the website and compare if there's some variation over time. Some automatic analysis would help. So uh, we focused here really on the process uh, analysis and the real, the process mining analysis, where you are really looking at everything. But I do know that there are some also some kind of um, yeah, components in UX Suite itself, where you could have some kind of dashboard or some kind of KPIs. Can you say something about that as well? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, that's that's a very good point. That that once you know what patterns you're looking for, you can of course tag them with a semantic label that I showed you before. That's the green thing, and you actually can put the these labels onto a dashboard and then simply chart the the number or the the duration or the occurrence of these kind of patterns over time. And then, of course, you can do all these things that you expect from dashboards or charting tools that you actually want to compare. How is the performance of this pattern versus the other? So um, the traditional segmentation, but also looking at what, what kind of improvement do I have this week or last month or something else. So that is very, very flexible once you tap into the power of this real-time processing chain. Yeah, there would be something um, in a trial, for example, you could then test and play with as well. OK, so for now, that was the last. Oh, no, I think. Let's see. So we also got some feedback, Matthias. People really seem to like the webinar. They say, um, great webinar. Thanks a lot. So, so thank you all for joining. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot.